As a writer, I spend a lot of time thinking about how the stories we tell define who we are, um, not only as people, but often more generally as Americans. So uh, in my life, I've been part of a story that has taught me a great deal about what it means to be an American. That story belongs to someone I know really well, uh, my mother, and takes place on a cold night last winter while we were out celebrating her 77th birthday. Yeah, mom. Um, so uh, now my mother is from Thailand, uh, which means that my sister and I, we decided that we should take her to a restaurant um, that would, you know, honor her heritage, um, a local sports bar called Pat's Pizza. Um, uh, it was a beautiful gathering. My mother, the matriarch of our family, sat surrounded by all of her relatives currently living in the United States, a somewhat small group, which includes me, my sister, our spouses, and my mother's five grandchildren, who all refer to her as Kenya, or grandmother in Thai. Uh, we ate a bunch of pizza, had a few drinks, my sister brought out a cake, and then we somehow convinced about a dozen semi-drunk Mainers to help us sing, Happy Birthday, Kenya. <laughs> and then my mother blew up the candles on her cake, pushed herself back from the table a few feet, and uh, kind of mostly to herself, no one in particular, said, there. Now, I have been an American for 50 years. Um, but let me say a few things about how my mother became an American. Um, she was born in a stilt house in a dusty village in rural Thailand. The oldest of five, her own mother died when my mother was still very, very young, um, leaving her uh, to raise her brothers and sisters. In 1969, at the height of the Vietnam War, my mother left behind a career as a teacher to travel 400 miles north to the border of Laos to work as the manager of an officer's club on a US military base. There she met a young officer from a place called New England, um, they fell in love, married, and at the end of his deployment, she followed him back to the United States. Things here got off to a pretty good start. Uh, my mother waited tables at Howard Johnson's, um, remember Howard Johnson's, uh, while putting herself through nursing school. In 1977, my sister was born. A few years after that, I came along. Uh, and then shortly after that, my father left our family to live with another family leaving my mother uh, really with no choice but to raise my sister and me in Maine uh, alone. I will never really know uh, what went through my mother's head during this period of her life. I know only what I saw, that she, in a second language and really with no help, did everything in her power to give my sister and me the kind of life that we saw all around us. In elementary school, I watched as my mother bought our first home, remodeled it all by herself. Every morning, she packed our lunch, sent us off to school, met with our teachers when we got in trouble, coached our soccer teams. In junior high, my mother enlisted in the local Army Reserve unit and even served two deployments during Operation Desert Storm as a nurse. In high school, I watched as my mother, by attending night classes at the local university, earned two master's degrees and then sent my sister and me off to college. All of this while working the night shift on the psych unit on about three or four hours of sleep. I know for sure that my mother, for the sacrifices she made in our name, suffered enormous emotional consequences, and yet not once in my life have I ever heard my mother complain that her life was hard. And yet, before I paint too zealous a picture of my mother as some kind of cardboard emblem of the American dream, I do want to go back to that thing she said, there, now I have been American for 50 years. Something about those words made me feel like I was finally able to see an invisible gate 
that for my whole life, sometimes without knowing it, I've been trying to pass through. And yet for the rest of that winter, I knew that I could not make that final passage unless I first answered two very important and very related questions. Number one, why would a woman who has lived in this country for 10 years longer than I've been alive still feel a need to keep track of how long she's been here? And two, what is it about my country that has convinced my mother, the most resourceful person I know, that doing such a thing was somehow productive? To answer those questions, I want to tell another story about the last time my mother and I went to Thailand. Uh, this was back in the fall of 2007. Um, we were there to make the most recent in a series of financial donations to help improve uh, the water systems, public schools, and um, Buddhist temples in my mother's village. Um, this was probably the proudest week of my mother's life. Every night there were huge celebrations followed by fancy dinners, delicious food, uh, award ceremonies and speeches made in her name. In my eyes, I felt like I was finally able to see my mother not as the person she'd always had to be, but as the person she aspired to be. And yet, as uh, we passed through customs, our experiences in Thailand um, stood in stark contrast. Um, an agent at the gate, he called us forward, and then only to me, asked for our passports, and then only to me, asked a series of questions about what we'd been up to, and then, without so much as looking at my mother, said to me, what about her? And uh, I looked at the man, he was about my age, about my size, wearing what I think was supposed to be a mask of um, intimidation or authority, and I said, what about her? And he paused and glanced at my mother and then back at me and said, is she an American too? Something about that simple question left me feeling utterly without words. And yet when I looked at my mother, thinking that she would have an explanation, what I saw left me feeling even more speechless. My mother stood, crouched over, head down, looking at her shoes, striking a pose that I sometimes called her old Asian lady impersonation. <laughs> the pose was meant to render herself invisible, or in this case, to prove to the man at the gate that she was too lost in this country to be a threat. At some point in her life, my mother had learned that it held more advantage for her rather than to act like the person she was, to act like the person this country had asked her to be. Call it what you will, coy, clever, sad, whatever, acting the part of the deferential old Asian lady was one of the ways that my mother had learned to survive. Now, um, I, I tell this story not because uh, I want to ask for sympathy for my mother or for me or for families, frankly, that have had experiences like ours. In all honesty, at this point, I think that we are so tired of telling our stories that um, we have learned, unfortunately, to ask America for absolutely nothing. Instead, I tell this story to illustrate a fact, that for nearly 250 years, in this land that we call our own, we have developed a somewhat radical obsession with inventing rules about who gets to call themselves an American and who doesn't. This condition, perhaps now more than ever, is as endemic a part of who we are as any flag that we might raise. We have applied these rules to people whose ancestors have lived on this land for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We have applied these rules to people whose ancestors came here against their will as the property of other people. We have applied these rules under the guise of laws and legislation, exclusion acts, quotas based on race, gender, class, sexuality, birthplace, country of origin. 
These rules have become an indelible part of our psychic geography. Reservations, plantations, internment camps, walls. All under the banner of equality. All under the premise that this land that we call our own is supposed to be a place of refuge. And so, at what point do we turn to one another and fess up to what I think we all know is true? That this story that we have been telling about who gets to be an American does not contain within it the possibility for a happy ending. And yet, I am just a writer. I have no major policy offering. I have no vast legislative agenda. I have only my experience as the son of a mother who, I am sure, no matter how long she lives here, no matter what she accomplishes, will never in her lifetime probably ever feel like she deserves a spot at this table. And so my plea is that those of us, like me, who have often taken our entitlement to Americanness for granted, that we spend less time thinking about who is an American and more time telling more honest, more complete, more accurate stories of how we became Americans. A privilege which very few of us A privilege which very few of us have done anything to earn. A privilege which, in most cases, rests on circumstances so fragile, so precious, so delicate, that most of us would call it an accident. Because more often than I would like to admit, I do think back to that moment at customs, when the man at the gate looked at my mother and then looked at me and said, what about her? If given a second chance, I would have taken a little more time to tell that man about my mother's story, to tell him about all the things she had done to become an American, about how hard she'd worked to make sure that I, her only son, could remain one. And then I would have asked that question to the man. I would have asked the same question. I would have said, what about you? How did you become an American? And I guarantee that his story would have started just like mine, with some brave person who left behind a beloved homeland for this strange new world, who very likely was scrutinized by some man at some gate who questioned that person's right to be here, and yet that person remained committed to that most basic and fundamental of human principles, to do anything, to travel anywhere, to make a better life for the children and grandchildren they love. Because these stories of becoming, our willingness to tell them and listen to them, but also to recognize them as part of some larger and more beautiful book might be one of the last and yet most important American things that we still have in common. Thank you.